So hopefully that gives you help. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. I'm gonna <laughs> get these done somehow. <laughs> you can do it. I'm just I'm just really it's bad hard. at completing things. That's my my big yeah. issue. Yeah, and and the best way to do that is to practice. Mm. Like you said it yourself, just do it. <laughs> What's the best way to finish a marathon? Just finish the marathon. All right. So as long as you can finish the the assignment, then we'll be able to um, critique it and talk about what you you're running into, like the issues that you're running into. Oh. Do my best, and then some. There you go. Any other questions, y'all? Uh, I have a question. Go. Uh, I, I sent you a link in the chat, and um, I wanted to ask if <laughs> what would you how this would right you here? yeah of Clint Eastwood yeah uh, it's from this amazing Taiwan artist I saw today or discovered today, and I wanted to know uh, how would you approach studying this and how would you try to like maybe you pick something up to put it in your style or just to get to this, to this closer to this level yeah let me ask you how do you think you would study this what would you do uh i tried it before now i, I put the uh, a photo and tried to uh, i looked at i looked at the uh, i looked at the painting of no, 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 no. hold on time out how would you study this image, the same image that we're talking about? No, probably trying to make a copy and looking at it and looking how try, and trying to make similar brush, brush strokes and, and always have a timer on to make that. Yeah. yeah, man, that's pretty and much how to that's, like, that's pretty accurate to what I would do. I think maybe mm -hmm. the only difference would be that I would try to do it without copying as well. I do it like copy as a tool to kind of understand and then, um, and then try to really dissect it. But see, that's the, so here, here's the, here's the catch though, right? Like I, um, I think a lot of times people ask this question and the reason why they ask is because they see this and they feel like it's a mystery, right? But all mysteries, there's, there's always an origin. Mm. And one of the things you do is you just observe. You just observe and observe and observe. And uh, I'll do another thing. Sometimes people don't do this. Like, just ask the artist. Yeah, How I started, the hell did you do this? Yeah. I started doing this actually. Yeah, yeah more, and, and more you'd be more. surprised. Like some respond, you know. Mm. Um, if they don't, you know, it's not like they're making jerk offs or anything. You know, it's just you mm. know, maybe they didn't see it or they didn't get time to respond. It's fine, mm. but but you know, asking it doesn't hurt. And then also another another thing is that I, I like to do is look at more of their artwork and see half completed versions of this type of stuff because yeah, yeah. that, that has more value sometimes than yeah. completed version because yeah. you can see the steps in between yeah. it's like a like an archaeologist or a scientist or any anybody that, that spends their time trying to find the truth to things like what do they do like how yeah. do scientists know that gravity uh pulls things in earth's gravity pulls things in at an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second yeah. how do they know yeah. that like yeah. they just pulled a number out of their hat randomly yeah, they, they, tested and tested. they tested and they researched and they observed yeah. there, there's never like so here, here's the kind of the catch is that like they're like the everything that you said is right that's the problem is that you might perceive it that there's wrong or there's a better way of doing it 
Yeah. And I've explained that there actually is a better way. And it's the, the way that it's better is to realize that it just takes continuous effort and analyzation. That's it. Mm. And that's usually, that's, that's the best way to do it. So when I say don't copy, study, it doesn't mean never copy. It just means don't just copy. Copy is just one of the many tools that helps you understand. Mm. Okay? okay? It's like trying to build a whole house using just your fingers. Mm. <laughs> like there's no reason for that. Like there's, a, there's tools yeah. now, right? You can use a hammer, you can use nails, you can use power drills, you can use cement maker machines, you know, all these different tools to build the house. It's not, yeah. one, not one tool is more value than others. Well, that's not true. There's some tools are more valued, but you get my point, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so how would I go about it? Well, the first step is what you said. I would try to first try to make the brush. That's like the first thing that knows. And then I'll just try to replicate this, try to make this look exactly the same. And that what that will do is it will help me know that I actually have control over my brush. Mm. I'm not so much sure if I'll have control over the painting. So the next step would be, okay, um, what is it, why is it so good? Like how, much, how many values is this person using? I would just color pick and see what values they're using, where they're using it, how they're using it. And then I'll say, okay, well, how are they approaching texture? Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry detail. You know, it seems pretty precise. They have a wide range of brush strokes, it looks like, you know? Yeah. And si from shapes and sizes. I just, just time will just give me more information, you know? I'll just, okay. but the, the thing is, what I do is just keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. I don't stop. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I keep going until I really have a good understanding. You see what I'm saying? That's how I go about studying the stuff. And uh, I've demonstrated this many times, right? Like, yeah. I, specifically me, I'm not doing anything special, okay? I'm just really resilient. Like, just because I don't know does not stop me from kid pursuing it. Yeah. Like, I don't get frustrated because I'm stupid is what I'm trying to get at, okay? Like, a lot of people do. A lot of you guys get frustrated because you don't, you don't like the fact that you don't know something, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, because why would I know that? How would I have known that if I didn't practice or try it? Like I'm that, I have that uh, perspective, you understand? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and that perspective is a, is a true one. That's the point I'm making here, you know? It's naive to think that I should just know everything for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, let me give you a good example. Like one time a, a person, uh, was asking me a question along those lines of like, he's like, look, I, I did what you said, you know, I studied and I practiced for like a whole day. I, pra I practiced drawing giraffes like for the whole day, dude. And I still don't know how to draw giraffes. Like I tried today and I just like feel like I'm starting from ground zero, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I said, like, oh man, that sucks. So let me ask you a few questions because that's how I roll, right? I always ask questions because those mm -hmm. questions lead to answers that people don't want to admit sometimes. So I asked him, I was like, so what's the, what's the scale, what's the size, uh, what's, the, what's the proportions between the head of the giraffe and the body of the giraffe? Like how many body, or how many heads fit in a body? And he's like, uh, I don't know. I was like, okay. So how many heads fit in the neck of the giraffe? He's like, uh, I don't know. I was like, what's the difference between a, the, the neck of a giraffe and a human neck? He's like, uh, I don't know. I was like, okay, is a giraffe an animal? Yeah. He's like, oh, yeah, I know that. Probably, yeah. <laughs> and I said, see, so from what I'm gathering, you know nothing about giraffes. <laughs> you know, you, you might have just copy and pasted what you saw. And I mentioned this many times before, is that that's, an, that's, that's a, a way of learning. You can learn by just doing that brute force, okay? but it's all passive. Like your, your brain's doing most of the work subconsciously. You're not actually mm -hmm. there, you know? Mm -hmm. And I say, you just gotta be attentive. You gotta pay attention and be asking questions like I've been asking and be completely and utterly devoted to knowing everything about a giraffe, you know? Mm 
and uh, is there other um, occasions where you go on autopilot for like where you should be attentive but you are not because I struggle with it, uh, to stay attentive. Actually, the, the timer thing that it helps, but before, I think, I don't know, when I started doing studies and stuff, um, I spent maybe a year or a year and a half or two years just doing copies and don't be really attentive. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's actually what um, a lot of beginners do. But um, now I try to stay attentive more and more, but uh, I do have like strategies for that. Too much, or too, um, I don't know, it's, it's hard to understand what you're saying. I've got to be honest. Oh, uh, sorry. Because I think your mic, like, it sounds like you're trying to be really quiet. Um, no, it sounds like you are. It sounds like you're you're really far away from your mic. So I was trying to listen to what you're saying, and it sounded profound. But I, <laughs> um, I, I, okay. Let me just see if I heard you right. You said for for uh, years you're in, you're in school. You're doing like mostly copying, and then nowadays you're doing you're paying attention a little bit more, and, and something along those lines, right? Uh, do you do you hear me now? Better? Oh yeah, it's a little bit better. No, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just uh, I was just asking because. Um, before I did only do I did only do copies copies, uh -huh. and now um, with the timer it's it's easier for me to stay attentive and focused. But sometimes I go. I drift away into this autopilot thingy, uh, where I just uh, do studies and don't think about it. And um, like you said, it's uh, it's an automatic thing that the that brain doesn't want to be engaged actually and just doesn't, doesn't want yeah. to spend a lot of energy. But do you have strategies to trick the brain? Timers, to man. Timers. Timers. Okay. <laughs> just, just make your timer shorter. So then if you're spending okay. like an hour and you're uh -huh. starting to drift, then cut it to 45 minutes. Okay. And if your brain starts to drift, cut it to 30. If it starts to drift, cut it to 25. Cut it to 20. Cut it to 15. Cut it to 5. You know what I mean? Until like your okay. brain's got to be there, you know, engaged. Um, one thing that I do too is I test myself often. Hmm. Meaning like, okay, I'll do a bunch of studies and then I'll do it without the reference to see what I've learned. People don't do this a lot. And they'll just, they'll why, just study, 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 but then they don't, they don't practice what they've learned. Yeah, and why, uh, I, I, uh, because I, I, don't, I didn't do it a lot because it's so uncomfortable. And why is it so uncomfortable? What's uncomfortable? The, the testing part, I feel like. Oh, it's uncomfortable because you don't know shit. <laughs> That you gotta, you have to, okay, think of it like this. Let's say you had a math test, right? And you take the math test and you fail the math test. What does that say about your knowledge of math? Yeah, don't have any problem. You don't, you don't know anything about the math. You, do, you don't know the answers to the questions. That's, that's why it's so uncomfortable, mm. you know? And so that should reveal to you that whatever you were studying, you weren't keeping, you weren't, it wasn't sticking. So you have to go back and try again. Mm. You understand? Like, uh, I mean, name one thing that you've done like one time at a master level. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of any. Yeah. So, so imagine that okay, you, you studied one time this one thing and tested it one time and it felt uncomfortable. Case closed. It's uncomfortable to test. <laughs> right? <laughs> it, it, when you put it into context, it make, it's, it's, it's kind of silly. Of course, totally, it's going to yeah. be uncomfortable. You, you're, you're, that's, that's the whole point of testing is to, to reveal how little you actually know. Hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, no. Actually, I think that's my, my peoples. Give me one second. No problem. Hello? Oh, I guess this is him. I just, the time just escaped me. I didn't realize it was already 12. When you're having fun, right? Anyways, okay, so um, 
So do you see do you see kind of like the kind of the funny part of this? The point I'm trying to make with you? Yeah. Right? It's like, supposed to be supposed to be uncomfortable. It's it it's supposed to be uncomfortable until you start to make you comfortable, right? You're you're supposed to earn that. You know, the the fact that it's challenging should always reveal to you that you're learning. Okay? Okay, great. And and okay. If, if you if you have that perspective, then it then you won't feel so salty when you suck. <laughs> right? Because that's what it ends up becoming. You feel salty. You're like, uh, I feel like everything should just be easy. <laughs> it's just like, no, nah, man. Not at all, dude. Like, you should have seen how long it took me to figure out how to do the code for um my first project. It was real uncomfortable, man. The whole time I felt like I was stepping on eggshells. Like if I wrote mm. one wrong thing, everything would crash and burn. <laughs> you know, but now I feel way better. I feel like if something crashes, I can find it and fix it. Mm. You know? Oh, nice. um, and and it is nice, but it took time. It took like a, a few months to really kind of get to that stage. So now I'm at a point where it it's it's like I feel like I can solve any problem. Because I've been through so many, I've been through the gauntlet for so long, so yeah. often, that I and I've solved problem after problem after problem that I feel pretty confident that there's mm. no there's no barrier now to prevent me from making the kinds of things I want to make, other than my time. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. I'm actually looking forward to your to your uh, Mac game. Yeah, it looks cool, right? And I just made that uh, in time spent. From the actual conception of it, uh, I probably spent maybe four days total. Oh wow! But it, it it took like I started it, yeah, last month at the end of last month. But I stopped for about two weeks because I was working on the the club stuff. But I mean, is it uh, is Play Canvas? Is it like a script language or is it? It's a, it's like a game engine. Okay. It's so like game, do you know Game Maker? Yeah, I do. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I played around with that a bit. But. Yeah, you played around with it. Doesn't mean that you did anything. Right? <laughs> right. And so, so like, you know, here's the game. I'm, I'm playing it right now. It's working. Mm, that's um, awesome. So I have a few things that I've put on my list of try to fix. Um, so I'm going to add another frame or two in this. So I'm going to make it another frame or two. It's going to be nice. And then it's going to make it smoother. But you know how long it took me to do this? Just this, not the movement parts. That actually took a while, like to make it respond the way that I expected. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what really, what really took a while. Now you can't shoot yet. Now that's another function I have to add later. One piece at a time, y'all. Like if you notice the background too, look at the background. Like it's like there's no floor, so I'm gonna add floor too. Um, there's a lot of stuff. So like I need to add like him landing. It's like cool, like special fix there. Like a little bit of like, like cool little like fire thrusters, you know, that'd be cool. Um, him shooting, him something to shoot at, <laughs> okay. And then, uh, um, but like this, this right here. Double jump? It or? going to, no, not the double jump. That was, that was really easy. He, I think he has a triple jump actually. I think one, two, three, four. Five. Now he's got a quad or a penta jump. Um, him going back to idle. Oh wow! Okay. Like something as simple as like, see, he, he does an animation, idle, animation, idle, animation, idle. Right? Huh. Took me forever. <laughs> Took me like the better part of my my work day yesterday. Not like the I, I gave myself like two hours to work on this. It took probably the an hour just to get it back to idle. Oh wow! And uh, but I wasn't frustrated. I was just like, okay, I need to kind of think about how the what what the code's trying to interpret right now. Mm, I tried three cool. different. I tried three different ways of doing it. I coded it one way where it was based off of velocity, but then I realized that's way too that's way too fidgety, and I don't know enough about that. So let's not do that. So then I uh, I tried. Um, uh, timeouts so basically having a timeout but then i realized timeouts kept on resetting so then there, i would start the timeout and there would be multiple timeouts playing at the same time and so then it would like 
it would it would interrupt the other animations. That was not ideal. Mm. And so then I was like, oh, you know what? I need to make a, a counter. And then when the variable is above a certain number, then put it to idle. And then whenever you do the other actions, just make make it make a negative value of the counter. So let's say it's counting to uh, it's counting just like one, two, three, right? And I'm mm -hmm. saying stay in idle if it's above zero. Okay. So as soon as it hits one second, we're good as rain, right? So then what can I do? Well, I can make when you dash forward, make the timer negative one. So when I hit okay. dash, it goes negative one. So then it's negative one, zero, one, two, three. When I dash again, negative one, zero, dash, negative one, dash, mm -hmm. negative one. See what I'm saying? So it always, so the, the player will always feel it's really responsive. And when they're not touching the keys, the counter's ticking back up to zero to one and beyond. And once it goes above zero, as I said, put it back into idle. So that way you can like spam the dash and it will keep playing the dash animation as you would expect and never interrupt because you're always constantly pressing a button to change it to negative one. Mm. And that works great. It works perfect. It works exactly cool. as, it, as it should, as I, as I want it to feel. It feels, it feels fun just to fly around like you just saw. Like that, mm. that, if it feels fun just to navigate, that you're, you're on the right track. <laughs> right? I, I just need to make yeah. things to shoot at to dodge, right? Yeah. And then make that fun. And so that's going to be the next step. And so I just have, I have like a schedule built into place right now. And I have things I need to code, like the shooting mechanic. I actually have a, a really simple solution to that. Uh, I think it'll work fine, like right off the bat. But see, I spent about a week making the code just for the animated sprites to play effectively the way that I want them. Like this was independent of the game. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's just because it's super challenging. I spent like literally weeks. I was like reading and doing like research and paying attention to like what I was trying to like learn more terminology of the engine. You know, mm. I was really trying to figure it out because I don't know. No. But I, I was never at any point just like, why is it so hard? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I know yeah. that it's hard. Mm. And I, and it's like I said with Ivan, right? Like I said to him, and, and I'll say it again and again, I know other people will start trying stuff and they'll fail. And then they'll be like, oh I, guess, I guess this is not for me. Mm. If you want to make a video game, then learn how to make a fucking video game. This is that simple. Like someone had to figure it out. <laughs> like how did they figure it out? You know, mm -hmm. it's not like anything magical. Does that help give you some more context with this whole testing and why it's okay to be bad? Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's yeah. it's absolutely okay to suck, guys. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody's keeping track other than you. Like, there's not like an employer that sees your work today and is like, you know what? I'm never going to give that person an opportunity ever, <laughs> ever. You see how bad their work is right now? <laughs> no, one th no one thinks that Can't way. Can't be good in the future. Yeah, there's no way this yeah. ever will be good. And if, if they think that way, then fuck them, man. Like, don't, you don't yeah. work with someone like that anyway. <laughs> you know? Mm. That doesn't give you, like, uh, the benefit of the doubt. So, yeah, just trust me. The, the, you guys won't be blacklisted. There's no, like, blacklist. Pay, paying attention to the worst artist. This is this is the more realistic. This is more realistically what happens. You, you show somebody your shitty portfolio. They say this is a shitty portfolio. And then they forget about you as soon as you walk away. That's <laughs> literally how it is. And then There's, up, There is some comfort in that. Yeah, and, and as you show up next year with an amazing portfolio. They're like, whoa, this portfolio is amazing. And you get to talk to the same person, you know? <laughs> They won't remember you. And if they do, remember them. Okay? Because there's something nice about people who remember you, you know, even when you're really bad. No. No. Like, there's a, I have a guy that I already know. Like he, he's, his name is Kenny. He's, he's that guy for me. I, would, I showed up one year with my portfolio. He's like, you're garbage. And I was like, oh, okay, great. He said it much nicer than that. But pretty much that's <laughs> yeah. that was the moral of the story. And then I came back and he's like, hey, I remember you. Hey, and your work isn't as garbage but it's still kind of garbage. And I was like, okay. But he, he was nice. He's like, I remember you. He's like, yeah, I, remember. I was like, you were really, you did this thing and you said that and you had the, that one thingy. And I was like, whoa, yeah. I was like, that's crazy. He's like, yeah, man, I pay attention. Nice. And, uh, and then the, in the following year, he was like, whoa, dude, you got real good, man. 
and he, he's like he's really that's why he's probably the best in the biz like he's that's what he does professionally hires artists mm. um nice and so so but there's other people people that i've admired that i told them that i met them in the past and they're just like nah no way and i showed them evidence of it they're like oh, i'm so sorry bro i was like no nah, <laughs> don't be man i sucked <laughs> there's no reason why you should have cared uh pick up from the thing that i did the last class this weird like long-legged mm. dude anyway ask away questions that may make you want to to have answers for make you want to have answers for that makes sense but anyway, yeah, go ahead, guys. <clears throat> when you could have one program, uh, ZBrush or 3D Code, which one would you choose? 3D or Code? Like hot, yeah, at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have to speculate on that. Yeah, 3D Code. Okay, good to know. Hands down, uh, no question about it. Is there any good approach for composition except rule of thirds? Um, rule, rule of thirds is just like a good starting point, mm -hmm. but what it, what it comes down to is just like good, um, good storytelling and narrative, I think. Okay. So like with concept art, like we don't have to have good story in our mm -hmm. concepts. Like you can kind of imply like what you did, mm -hmm. like you can imply some sense of story, but if mm -hmm. it's not there, there's no one's going to miss it. You know, uh, let me give you an example. I, I like to compare uh, Boba Fett. Mm -hmm. Okay. Boba Fett versus um, Darth Vader. Mm -hmm. You look at like a character like Darth Vader, like his design isn't that inspiring, but his, his story is rich. Like he's fallen from grace. He's the one that brings balance to the force at the end because his son redeems him you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Boba Fett just looks cool mm -hmm. he doesn't do anything cool in the movies <laughs> <laughs> you know he just yeah. looks cool he has a cool spaceship and that's pretty much it you know mm -hmm. and um wow this is this makes a great little texture brush wow that's pretty cool sick um I feel like I'm getting an allergic reaction right now from something. What did you put in that smoothie? Smoothie? Yeah, I'm talking to my wife. Hold on. <laughs> Maybe it's too much nuts. So I just ate those nuts too. Yeah, my throat feels like it's burning a little bit. Anyway, don't worry, guys. If, if I die <laughs> mid mid critiques, you'll still have to turn in your homework. Um, but with the compositions, yeah, it's pretty vi vital. Like that's because that's like the the whole purpose of a composition is to like get people interested in whatever it is, and you want to like, tell as much story as possible in that yeah. short amount of time. The short amount of time is meaning the glance. People just glance at the artwork. And so rules of third just works fine, but there's, you know, centering your composition is pretty nice. Uh, what else is a really good tactic? You know, just um, putting a lot of tangencies on purpose is, a, is, a, is an interesting way of going about it. There's all kinds of good examples. As long as it's like fits the frame of context. Yeah, I think it actually mentioned the Hitchcock, the direct the director Hitchcock mentioned about the size of the thing in composition. It it means the how much how matter in that scene. Yeah, I think uh, I think one thing that a lot of designers forget to talk about mm -hmm. is context. Mm -hmm. Like, what is 
the context in which your image is is portraying you know like if you focus on oh wait i still have nearest neighbor on maybe automatic um if you're portraying your concepts mm -hmm. to be for children then you know having them colorful and super dynamic and all over the place mm -hmm. it's fine you know what i mean well mm -hmm. this is enormous I'm not sure why it's having a hard time why give me the option to cancel if it won't even cancel? Photoshop, you silly, silly goose. Um, so, you know, I, I usually don't worry about stuff like that. I usually like about like the rules of third and all that kind of stuff. Like all of those types of things are just really helpful guidelines. Mm -hmm. Very, very helpful. You know, especially if you're really starting out, you don't know anything about anything. Um, but like, like I, I say all the time, like you can always find examples though that will break these rules, you know, mm -hmm. and they work and you love them. Mm -hmm. Right. So check it out. Let's, let's talk about this for a second. Have you seen Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Uh, not entirely, it's but fun. I love the scenes from this series. Yeah, so this is from the movie. So check it out. So this composition is flat. It's mm -hmm. a flat composition, perfectly cut in the middle. There's barely any perspective. The camera lens is pretty shallow. Right, even the camera moves are pretty static. Man, the animators are amazing. Hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So think about it. Okay. So let's let's talk about something. So. In the scene, you know, there's a cute little baby. The mom's like, all right, you be cute, little baby. And she talks to Roger Rabbit, says, you better watch the baby or else. He's like, mm -hmm. don't worry, I got it under control. Right? <laughs> and he's like, you count on me and everything's will be A-OK. -okay. <laughs> all right. And then yeah. so he close the door. And he's like, see, nothing. What the? Socks his nose. It's kind of funny. Yeah. And watch what happens. So the baby's like, ooh, I'm going to escape. Right, he's yeah. counting, he's just completely distracted with what he was saying before. But look, there's now some perspective. Mm -hmm. But think about the context. The baby's escaping. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it's still flat because the baby's not in any imminent danger. But now look, dynamic camera move in extreme third three-point perspective. You see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But watch what happens when he looks back at the crib. Look at the perspective now. Mm -hmm. See how it's changed completely? And look, there's a tangencies all over the place. Yeah. Tangents are bad, right? But not in the context of like you're saying something terrible has happened. Mm -hmm. You want the audience to feel a little unnerved. Mm -hmm. And then look at all the perspective now. Everything's like fish lens almost. Mm -hmm. You know, knives and forks. So he goes from the super straight point of view, right? To all of a sudden, super dynamic camera moves. Wow. Look at this. This is insane. Mm. Like the kitchen goes from like feeling like it's not that big mm -hmm. to enormous in some scenes. Right? It feels like in miles. Mm. Like look at this. <laughs> it seems so good. It's a great film too, by the way, if you haven't seen it. So watch this again and just kind of pay attention to like why they did such a good job. Mm. And that's why I sent that um that that document with like the move like the webpage with the movie links a while ago because those movie frames are, are really nice to kind of study from. 
mm-hmm. for the same reasons. Like you'll find that to be true. So you look at someone like Stanley Kubrick and you think, oh, you know, Stanley Kubrick, he makes these amazing films. He might have like a, a super epic camera angles. He actually doesn't. He has some of the most simplest camera angles. In fact, that's probably why a lot of his movies feel really unnerved because all of his camera angles are pretty static and really like, like almost perfectly symmetrical and nothing's that perfect, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's because he does that and it makes you feel weird about his, his movies, you know? And then you look at someone like Michael Bay where you feel like, oh man, what's, what's going on half the time? It's because he's like constantly mixing up the angle, but he's not doing it to the point where it's, it's not, and it's not, it's like not controlled. It's like controlled chaos. In some instances, he doesn't get a little ahead of himself, but in most of the time, he's, he's one of the best in the business. And, um, you know, the guys who do Fast and the Furious understand this as well, mm-hmm. you know? And so, it's, you know, you'll see, you'll see people say, you know, don't do that because it's bad filmmaking. Yeah, I made billions of dollars. Can't be that bad. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, you just, I think context matters. Mm. And that's probably the most important thing. Because rule of, rule of four, thirds works for instances where rules of thirds works. Maybe like just as an establishing shot, it's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you can just have a symmetrical composition too to establish a shot. And you can have a dynamic composition to establish a shot. But what's the context, right? Like if you're trying to tell the audience that the world is chaotic and everything is falling apart, so you start off with a super... Uh, dynamic illustration you know that's you're setting a really good precedence then right and then when you show the, the main character for the first time and it's super static you know mm-hmm. then you're probably mm-hmm. saying something about that character and you're saying that character is really stoic or static like his personality or her personality isn't as dramatic you know got it yeah but don't ever assume that like you know there's one that fits one size fits all type of thing. It's a good starting point. If you really want to get better at that, I would say I recommend a book called Framed Ink. Frame uh Framed Ink. Uh, I buy I bought it. Yeah. Yeah. Read through it again. Really, really that good. guy yeah, that guy yeah. is pretty spot on. Yeah. Cool. Anybody? Anybody else? Yes. Yes. I'm wondering, do you, uh, how do you store it? Well, first, do you store notes about critiques that you get and do you have a system for it? Is that Adam talking? Yeah. The master note taker. (laughs) 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 Well, well, you know, I don't want to critique your way of critiquing my critiques Uh, (laughs) or like note taking. There's a, there's a few ways of, um, note taking. I think there's a Cornell note taking cornell notes have you heard of this yeah they had us do that in science class in middle school well, okay so they were on to they, they were on to the, the they were on to something right but like this is great where uh, i'm not sure about this questions and notes but like um this method is where you would have the way that I take notes um, is I just like write down what makes sense. I'm not sure that that's the best way of doing it. I'm just saying I write down what comes to mind. So let's say I'm listening to somebody talk, right? Let me think about something that I um, that happened to me recently. Ah, okay, so I was watching this thing about um, I was watching this thing about uh, grids grids using css so so according to like the history of css css is like this kind of like way of styling your your elements in your markup and markup would be the html code right and to to make things like font size and all kind of cool stuff happen right so like you know a grid oh sorry not let's not talk about grids yet but like uh so so basically what this will do styles would do like css would do is like if you wanted a font to be larger you can just you know you could put it into the code you can be like font size equals whatever right 
and then it would make the font size on your page larger or smaller. You can have the background color equal something and then it would change the background color of whatever. But like all of this is like weird because then like in HTML, what you would have to do is like you would have all these like elements and they're separated by tags and then the tags are separated by classes and, and then you would have elements inside elements, you know, and elements within elements and elements within elements and elements just to make like something as simple as like a grid, gridded website, like something as simple as a header and a body that's separated with different components within that body, right? And it's like this super crazy challenge. So what I got out of the grids, what I did mentally, I took mental notes, basically what they, they were saying is that grids just make it so that you first design the grid of your website. So you could say it is like a four by four grid of like 100 pixels, right? As the max or the min, the minimum. So no matter how the web page scales, it will always make these minimum 100 pixels or maximum 100 pixels. I forget what, but I'm still just learning it. And uh, and then you can just do stuff like, you know, make this this element sit in here in like grid cell one and two uh, from columns in row one. Does it make sense? And that that's just intuitive. And this has just been invented recently, like within the last year, I think. Okay. And people were just like, why did it take so long? <laughs> you know, like this is so obviously simpler, you know, than what they do now. And it is like, I, I have not had to deal with the headaches of the past as much. I've dealt with it already a few times. So I understand kind of like, I, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But the future generation of web designers won't have to worry about this at all, right? They'll be like, what? You guys had to do it that way? You know, like some super archaic way. It's like the same thing when you hear about people who rigged for the, um, what you call it, who rigged, rigged and animated for Jurassic Park. This, supposedly, they did it using spreadsheets. Could you imagine, like, animating something so insanely epic as, like, a dinosaur running using spreadsheets? Right. I mean, I could imagine it, but yeah, I can't imagine. True. You can imagine it, but yeah. you can't imagine trying to do that intuitively. Yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like the the sentiment I'm I'm trying to parallel to, right? Is you you know, I'm seeing that that this like this I'm at, I'm I'm at a turning point in the CSS world. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate that I'm like right here when it's happening. Okay, so I don't have to deal with the alternative. Which I was going to, don't get me wrong, I was more than happy to, because it was just a standard, but now they're saying, no, all browsers support grids. So I'm like, all right, dope, okay? So I was like, well, I won't learn the other stuff. Uh, I'll only learn it if I need to, right? Sorry, I'm parched, drank some vitamin water. But I am gonna learn some of the older stuff just because it is important to learn some of it, but. I'm not going to make the staple of my diet. So, so what did I do? So how did I take notes of that? Right? Well, I watched the video and instead of taking notes, what I do is I save it. Like I grab it and I save it on a different platform called keep Google keep. And Google keep is just all of the stuff that I've, found uh, another thing that i will do is i have been building watch later lists i need to go back and organize this but on my youtube i made a lot of like different playlists okay and so then all i do in terms of note taking is really not take notes what i really do is prepare myself to test what i've learned or to learn what i want to learn you know in the future so today for instance i have a list of stuff that i have to do and out of the list of things that I do, one of them is code training. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then all I'm going to do is once I cross out all these other things on my list, eventually, and we talked about this before, I'll get to the code training. And then when I get to the code training, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to YouTube. Okay. 
I'm going to watch PewDiePie. No, I'm just kidding. Probably can go to history. No, I can just go to CSS. Okay. So I, I got two. I got Retro Andrew, and then I get this other one. Uh, CSS grid layout introduction. I got two videos that I'm going to power through. Okay. And so, so for instance, this one, there was, she's, in, she's in explaining, like she's going to explain kind of like the concepts behind some of these things. But, um, and she was explaining it. I was like, ah, oh, this makes sense. I like what she's, how she's explaining it. I'm going to watch this later. And so this is how I go about it. I just like skip through, I find um, certain things, but then I'll also go into Mozilla Grid because I already found this, I memorized this. A grid inspector, right? I think just grid CSS. This is not it though. This looks more in depth though for whatever reason, but this is not what I'm looking for. I had another one that I used. Oh, wait, this might be it. Oh, this is actually pretty useful. Oh. Actually, I might like this. Oh, I'll come back to read that later. Yeah, I think this is the one that I was going to use. Like there's a template, right? So let's check it out. You, uh -huh. can, you can see how there's the result and there's something called a uh, code pen. Code pen is like a way you can sketch in, uh, you can basically sketch and design in here, right? So you don't have to always open up a thing. And I was just gonna go in here and just like read and, and understand what's going on here, okay? So like, this says header left, head head, 30 pixels, header right, you know? And I'll just be like, hmm, what happens if I change this to 12 pixels and hit save, see what happens. Oh, it won't let me until I sign up. I already signed up. Oh, see, but it looks like it changed that. It's changed it to 1200 and save again. So see, it's changing the navigation. So whatever is in the navigation, so this footer left, footer right, like I need to figure out what this means. And I'll just go ahead and just start testing. So like I'll read this stuff and I'm like, okay. So this says the footer is red and it's named footer. Okay, got it. So like, how do I know, how do I know, how, how does the grid know that this is the header? Is this just part of the code? You know what I mean? Like, is this just the code and it just knows, right? Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, does it just know that it's supposed to do this? Um, because like header left, oh, you know what? I get it. I get what's going on here. So what this is doing is it's paying attention to like, like the nav, the navigation is taking like, so this is a two by three. You see that? Head, head, nav main, nav foot. You see that? And it's one, two, three. So it's three rows, one, two, two columns. You understand? So, so if I were to change this to main, right? This yellow area should go up right here, right? And take over this quadrant. Let me draw it with annotation so you can see what I'm saying. Like this right here should also be a main now too. Got it? Okay. Because that's what I think. I, and you might not understand this, but I like I'm a little further along, right? Well, there's only one way to find out. Oh, look, it, it automatically changed. I didn't have to even save it. It just did it. So if I do this, if I change it, so if I want the header to take over all of this navigation, I just need to change this to head and then change this to head. And there it is. Right? Mm -hmm. And then I just have to understand what the pixels are doing here. 50 pixels, 100 pixels, nothing's changing. I don't know what's going on here. Okay, 
So I would have to go through here and kind of analyze what's happening even further, right? But it's fine. Like I'm just here to just play around. Copen's dope, man. I love this. So nice. Thanks, Captain Anonymous. <laughs> and so that's how I go about note taking is that I don't really do notes. I just go and learn. You know what I mean? I, I, I try to put to practice what I have learned. So so if I was in class and I had somebody teaching a thing, right? I would be writing down things to practice. That makes sense? So remember how I was doing the thing with like the, uh, with the different layers of color, solid color layers and stuff like that, right? I would say solid color layers, AJ did all this stuff and I would write as many things as possible. And if I missed a thing, I'd be like, teacher, what did you do there? I, I didn't catch that, you know? And teacher would hopefully be like, oh yeah, you just do this just in case you didn't catch it the first time. And then, all right, great. And then when, when class is over, go, what do I do? I go and test that, that very simple thing. Because I say a lot of things in class and, and a lot of the things I say um, don't necessarily need to be taken as notes entirely, right? If you just listen, usually you can kind of be um, inspired, right? By the, the words that are being said versus just like um, straight up like, like, I don't know how else to explain it. Like, there's, 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 there's not a, a lot of need for you to necessarily take every single word that I say, but maybe hit on the larger points and put them to practice. I guess that's really all it comes down to. So I think I, I used to do a thing where I used to take notes all sorts of ways. Um, and I think the most practical use of notes is notes that will drive action. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm writing a note of it. <laughs> Drive action, like basically do something about it, right? And so when I would, whenever I would watch a lecture and stuff, I would usually latch on to what I can do later on versus what they're saying to me, you know? And I try to ask as many questions as possible to help me understand it better uh, when I'm by myself and I don't have them to ask questions every five seconds, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but we live in an age of like YouTube and, and Gumroad tutorials and stuff like that, and even access to some teachers, you know what I mean? So you can even just ask questions straight up to these people, but hopefully you get my point. Like I don't really take note notes anymore. I used to all the time. But I realized I never would go back to them. So I was like, what's the point of writing all these notes if I never would go back and read them? And what's the point of reading these notes if I don't really understand them either? That's when like, I, I saw like, recently this Cornell note-taking process. It makes sense. Because the Cornell is, is set up so that you're, it, it encourages you to come back to read them later. Uh huh. Right? And encourages you, encourages you to take action. So hopefully that helps. Oh yeah, it does. I, I, uh, knowing what to put down has been a mystery lately. Yeah, I'd say the, the if we had to kind of just summarize what I just said, take notes that re like basically make you do something later. Okay, like have notes that will encourage you to do something later. Mm hmm. And, and that, that way you, you will focus more your attention writing down notes that will help you reinforce that. So like I said, like when I was talking about the solid color layer stuff, like taking notes extensively there would be useful because it would, you'd be writing down all the things that I was doing and then you would try to replicate it later, you know? And then you would also write down the reasons why I was doing it. And so that would give you some, some perspective, you know? Mm-hmm. Versus just me saying stuff like, uh, you guys just gotta like keep painting. You know, that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily need to be written down because it's like just generally good advice that you can just listen to. Now you imagine like when you're talking with a friend, 
right? Like when you're hot, hanging out with somebody and let's say you're going through something, something traumatic in your life. I mean, do you take notes of what all the advice that they're giving you? Not really, right? You just kind of listen and, and just try to take it as it's being told you. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I do. Yeah. Well, maybe you're different, Adam. <laughs> you know, everyone's different, but like, but I don't. And I think the majority of people don't, right? Like if someone tells you, um, you should go eat at this restaurant, uh, very rarely would you be like, like write on notes on that. You usually, if you forget the name, you can just ask him again and they'll just tell you. All right, but you'll remember why. So, yeah, yeah, so and so said this restaurant was really good because they had this good service and all stuff. Um, yeah, we, we're really good at retaining information like that without necessarily writing it down. But I think the kinds of stuff that um, that I do differently is like I'm, I'm, I try to be as cognitively aware of what's happening when I'm in class as much as possible whenever I was in class. So hopefully that helps you out, bud. Yeah, it does. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? I have one. Uh, right. My former job is kind of illustration job. Uh -huh. And the major problem is quality control. Uh, what I really amaze by you is you even the 30 minutes painting, it looks like it, it looks so done. It's complete. It feels complete. But in my case, at the, at the beginning, it's very fast. But mm -hmm. un, until, until 70%, it's, it's, a, it's very fluent. And after 70%, to, I can't reach the 100% 100, 100 of the quality. I, mm -hmm. I put a lot of time and uh, it, sometimes it looks bad worse, worse than two hours ago or three hours ago. So go back to yeah. the stage and draw again and it never done. <laughs> Something like that, it uh -huh. is my main issues. So uh, what do you think uh, about what gives the sense, sense of the complete, what makes artwork uh, gives? kind of sense of quality or complete uh when everything is defined defined and, yeah and defin defining things doesn't mean like one million percent rendered it just means mm -hmm. it's defined like th that we have a good sense of what the artists had mm -hmm. in mind mm -hmm. and you'll see that people will have a little bit looser sketches, but yet it's super defined. We get a good yeah, yeah. idea of what they're doing. Uh -huh. And, and the reason, the problem that you're running into uh -huh. is that you don't take your paintings to finish as often as you should. And, and you don't do it in a, f in a speed, like a, with a speed in mind, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you just kind of do it until you feel like it's done. What you should do is say, I have 10 hours total to finish a painting. And that's all you have. So after 10 hours, if you still feel like it's incomplete or it's not as good, mm -hmm. then write down all the reasons why. Write down all the things that you've done wrong, what mm -hmm. you could have changed. Mm -hmm. Okay? You don't do this often enough. You, you just kind of let it um, marinate. Because when you... Uh, when you leave your paintings loose and sketchy and just kind mm -hmm. of low fidelity, like you were saying, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there's still a lot of opportunity for the viewer, for us, mm -hmm. to kind of take guesses at what's going on. You understand? And kind of, yeah. <laughs> like, okay, so like if we go back and look at your uh, sketches, uh -huh. right? Like, there's still a lot to be interpreted. It's mm -hmm. not done. Mm -hmm. And because you start to refine it, you start to reveal that you yourself don't even know what's going on in the painting. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense? Like, you might have thought you did, but it was an, it was an impression even onto you. And mm -hmm. so finishing paintings, I always require people to do this. Not because it's an industry standard. Like, a lot of companies sometimes don't even care, right? 
Yeah. It makes it, it's mostly for you. Mm-hmm. It broadens your ability. So if someone did ask you to take it to an ungodly amount of render, you could. Mm-hmm. Right? But it also helps you know what the hell you're drawing. Right? Like it, it tells you that when you leave a mark, you're not just leaving it just because and you'll, you'll fix it later. No, it's already fixed. It's just a matter of defining it now. You so, get it? So, so should I uh, take a limit on my work time and always, and, yeah, and, and it, then check the artwork and it feels still undone. So take a time again and do it until it feels done. Yeah, just like, well, no, I, I would say, let's say you had, you do a painting, you spend 10 hours on it or two hours or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you look at it and say, what did, what did I do? So, well, for about an hour, I was focused on anatomy. Like I couldn't get the anatomy right. Mm-hmm. So maybe if I know how to do my anatomy, then mm-hmm. I can save time. So then you go pull, pump, uh, pull out some anatomy books and start mm-hmm. learning some anatomy. And then you started getting your anatomy sharp and then you can start handling your anatomy in, in less than an hour now. But mm-hmm. now you start to realize your materials are all jacked up. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, I spent like you know, several hours working on my material. So maybe I need to work on how to determine material faster. You know? Mm-hmm. You go and practice material. And then you come back and now you can get your materials done in it within an hour, right? And you just keep going back and forth, back and forth. You know? And eventually your anatomy again is bad. You know, your anatomy starts to surface that it's not very good anymore, you know, because everything else is starting to catch up, mm-hmm. right? So then you're, okay, I need to go back to the drawing board with anatomy again. But technically, you're not. You're, you're actually still more advanced than you were prior. Mm-hmm. You know, you're, you, it's just the context has changed. Now you, um, you can see more obviously how bad your anatomy is, and you can see it more clearly before you weren't able to. But as you get better at different things, you start to see th- different things. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, I could do a process where I draw a line art, mm-hmm. and I can draw like the components and get the perspective going, mm-hmm. and I can try to design like you know all the different facets of the design and mm-hmm. all the elements, get the proportion into place, mm-hmm. do all that. You know, I can start to you know. Uh, draw in kind of contours of how the shape might be, all the stuff with the tubes and texture. The t- I can do all that, or I can just draw the shape the first time mm-hmm. accurately <laughs> and start putting in the forms yeah. immediately. Mm-hmm. And then I can start putting in the detail mm-hmm. immediately. Mm-hmm. and work from there and start getting the materials in there sooner than later. Right? Yep. But how do I do that? Lots of fucking practice. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I just spend yeah. a lot of time learning how to do all this stuff. See, th- there's a clear s- speed difference, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so I just learned is like, okay, and like these marks aren't accidents either. It's not like I don't know what I can do with this stuff. I can totally repair anything that I've done here, mm-hmm. and immediately take it from loose sketch to potentially fully realized painting as you were commenting on flattering me with my Mm. ability to do that. Like Mm -hmm. I can do that only because I don't just guess. I put in real information. The birds, is that you? No. Those are my birds. Oh. Well, I mean, they're birds outside my window. (laughs) Those are birds are mine. That one's Leroy. That one's Jeff. You know? 
I call this one Stephen because he's a seagull. <laughs> you see what's happening there? Mm -hmm. And I'm just defining the details and the features instantaneously. And it's not because I'm this magical wizard. I just practice a lot. I practice more than anyone else, specifically in the speed department. There's only a few other people I can think of that can paint as fast, if not faster than me. Now, I'm not trying to brag. It's just that's what I've done. I've trained myself to do that. And I said I'm not the fastest because there are people faster than me. And I will also say this, speed is not important either. Mm. If it takes you seven years to do one painting, maybe speed might be a factor for you, right? But, you know, if it takes you a week or two to do one really nice painting, that's fine. That's, that's standard. Maybe it takes me a few days. That's fine. You know? Mm -hmm. But if it takes you, you know, like a whole weekend to just do half is what I can do. Don't like, don't keep yourself up at night. That's very, you're, you're comparing yourself to someone who's trained themselves to do that for no real reason other than I like to just be really good at stuff, right? It's not necessary. No one's like, uh, when I get hired, nobody's like, yeah, so how long does it take you to do one sketch? Like they don't ask that right away, you know? Mm -hmm. they, they just look at my work, they wanna hire me and they just presume that it's going to take some time is usually the opposite. They get shocked when they find out that I can do things quickly. Okay. Very uh, rarely do, does someone say I'm, we're hiring you specifically because we know you can paint like under an hour or something like that. Nobody does that. Yeah. But at work, uh, there are deadline and I have to give some, uh, information about how, when, when can I, when it's, when it's done. So. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, you don't have to be like in an hour, you can just mm -hmm. tell them it takes you a week or two. Just be honest. Yeah. yeah nobody's going to be like, what? A week. Um, like if you said something crazy, like I said, like a 17 years or something, then maybe they'll reconsider <laughs> your employment, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think even like a month might be too long, right? But like, but that sounds obvious. Like to just do one painting and if you were spending eight hours a day, you know, mm -hmm. like if it takes you like a month, mm -hmm. what is that? That's like a hundred, no, yeah. It's like 160 hours. That's a lot of hours on one painting, mm -hmm. you know? And I actually know artists who do that. They spend like 160 hours on one painting. Um, but they still get work because their paintings are freaking amazing, you know, mm -hmm. but I know people who paint potentially just as good as some of these people and, uh, take some several hours, like a day or two. Usually what takes the longest for me is not so much my own painting. It's like the client approving it. That's what usually takes the longest. Mm -hmm. Like if it was, um, if I was approving my own artwork, it'll be done as soon as I finished. <laughs> like I'm like, okay, this is good ship it this is my personal work you know mm -hmm. uh, i really rarely care about the quality of my work because i'm always on to the next painting i just care about quantity i'm just all about pushing that iteration button yep all right does that help yep. you yeah i think so <laughs> yeah so so just to recap you got to practice um paint, painting done. Faster. yeah mm -hmm. painting things to a finish more often yes that's what you got to do because you'll, you'll just learn you'll just learn a lot about yourself and what you do it's it's a little bit harder to do it in the context of let's say your job because you mm -hmm. can't you're not there's no room to, to make mistakes as much but when you're yeah. doing it for yourself, you can totally make mistakes and be a little more objective. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, I would say don't test it with work, test it with your own stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Like, so you have this assignment, right? That I'm asking you to do to render those three concepts by next class. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, try to get them done spending at least, I would say, if you spend at least four hours on each, that's like 12 mm -hmm. hours total from here to next class. Cause I know you have full-time job mm -hmm. that makes it that's manageable. Mm -hmm. Especially we're going into the weekend. Yeah. So see how far you can go okay. <laughs> and then write down why it was taking you so long. Like what were you doing for so long? Time mm -hmm. yourself often. Like don't just time yourself for the overall project. Time yourself for, um, for every instance. So like, time yourself for every every other minute not every other minute every other hour mm. so after an hour goes by ask yourself how much you've gotten done how much you wish you got done and mm. go from there yep and and here is other question <laughs> uh when something 90 percent done uh the Art, art is some kind of. Sometimes it's it's just so subjective, right? Uh huh. So, at work, we have different opinion about the, what's the better way, about subtle difference or uh -huh. something like that. So, do you have any experience with? at your work yeah I, like I, I usually just uh do what i'm asked to do because mm -hmm. it's a job right mm -hmm. if you're getting paid and people tell you to draw you know cats climbing mm -hmm. climbing trees and you're like but that but where's the substance you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you have to realize that's your job is to just draw cats and trees if you don't like it you know find a new job right yeah. Like so you said, like the. That, like that's the, why I, yeah. I, I moved to a second job. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like you, you even are saying to me, like with the job you have currently, with all these like crazy, you know, Chinese, yeah. uh, like illustrations and concepts, yeah. a little too crazy yeah. for your your own taste. Then mm -hmm. just start building a portfolio to do stop doing that stuff. But like, start to realize, like, don't just start taking jobs now anymore, for the sake of just taking jobs, you know, because you you've seen it seems like you've experienced what I've always warned people of. It's just because it's a job doesn't mean you're going to enjoy it and you're going to feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. right? So at least try to get work doing the kind of things you do, even if you get paid less, um, you'll feel better at the end of the day. And then one thing that I um, try to remind people is like, yeah, you get paid. if you're getting paid and they're paying you well, you mm -hmm. really, yeah, you really shouldn't, shouldn't be um, complaining. Yeah, I mean that's that's your job is to do whatever they're asking you to do. Now, obviously, there are some ethical ramifications. Like if they were to yeah. to mistreat you like ethically, mm. you know, then obviously you can't stand for that. But if they're just like telling you to draw like something that you disapprove of, that's not that's that's your job description, you know? Yeah. Um, and so uh, I was I'm like I'm a really good employee in that sense because I usually just tell, like people say hey just draw this chart with lasers and I'm like, all right got it and I just do it and try to do my best and if, if they don't like what I did then I say okay I'll do it again mm -hmm. I just do it again and again and if they ask me my opinion then maybe I'll tell them my thoughts mm -hmm. but you know you have to also consider that maybe you're not all that uh -huh. <laughs> you know maybe maybe you don't know what the hell you're talking about right mm -hmm. and and to assume that maybe you know better is also kind of pretentious. So you have to just assume maybe you, you're you not as educated as you might think you are. It's like a, here's a good way of thinking about this is like, I don't listen to Rotten Tomato reviews. Mm. Um, not to say that I don't trust people's opinions on some of the things that they say. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's just opinions, just a bunch of people's opinions and mm -hmm. people who've never made a movie. In, in a lot of cases, right? That people just watch movies. Mm -hmm. Just because you watch a lot of basketball doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're now good at basketball, does it? Yeah. Right? Just because you watch a lot of art tutorials doesn't mm -hmm. all of a sudden make you an amazing artist, does it? Mm -hmm. You know? And mm -hmm. so uh, I stopped listening to people <laughs> that critique <laughs> movies. Uh, and I actually started paying attention to 
um, movie creators and how they talked about movies. There's mm-hmm. this thing called the Hollywood Reporter here in the States, and they have YouTube videos where they will get like seven or eight of the, the latest directors of the latest films, and they'll put them together in a room mm-hmm. and just have them talk to each other about like the movies that they've made just recently. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so much more insightful mm-hmm. than listening to some guy saying like, I don't like the Ninja Turtles because they added nostril. <laughs> it's like, yeah. that's not really, that is truly subjective. Now there is something to be said if you see like the ratings all across the board or like 90 and like 100, you know, like everybody loves it on every platform. There's something mm-hmm. to be said that that could be trusted usually when you see just everyone around the world just has rave reviews about something. Mm-hmm. Um, and the same could be true if it's like everybody hates a movie. Yeah. You know? But if it's in between, if, if it's in the middle somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. I, I generally don't trust it. I don't trust yeah. anybody's opinion. I go watch it for myself. Yeah. And so um, I feel the same way when you work for somebody. You should understand that, mm-hmm. like, maybe they understand the market better than you do. Like, you mm-hmm. know, your, your personal taste and you know what you like. But maybe mm-hmm. the company you work for isn't designing things that you like. It's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like if you work for a company that sells things for children and you're like trying to put this stronger narrative, um, you might be you might be misplaced. You know? Yeah. There's a place for everybody. There really is. But you have to respect that some people care about other things more than than others. It's just how it is. So let me give you a good example. Um Ghost in the Shell. Did you like uh, Ghost in the Shell, the anime and the the live action film? Did you watch it? Uh, I watched it and I prefer animation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so people that I said saw who watched the live action, they they liked it uh-huh. more than they disliked it. But there were people that definitely disliked it as well. Uh-huh. But who cares? Nobody went and watched it. That means the majority <laughs> of people didn't really even care. Yeah, it's it, it's like okay, they were making this movie for the fans, or were they making it to be commercial success? Who were they catering it to? You know, they totally missed the mark. If they were trying to make money, they totally failed. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. if they were to just made the movie that was for the fans, they could have probably made all their money. But the reality is, do do people even want to watch Ghost in the Shell? Like, is Ghost in the Shell even good? And I'm mm-hmm. talking about the anime too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm saying like, is it actually any good or do you just like it because you're like a nerd, you know? <laughs> like for instance, yeah. like I watch Akira and yeah. I don't understand. I still don't really understand the narrative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've watched it a hundred times and I own the movie. Yeah. And the only reason why I like it has nothing to do with the story. It has everything to do with what's going on. Like I love like when Tetsugo freaks out and he becomes like this crazy mutant thing. And like the the teddy bear scene is freaking yeah. bizarre. It's just really surreal, yeah. and that's what makes me like it a lot. It just makes no sense too. It's just like this weirdly over overly political movie. I can care less, um, but it's just so visually stunning. Mm-hmm. You know. So, by the way, but does it make it any good? That's what I'm saying. Uh, so did you did you saw the original comics of the Akira? Yeah, 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 I saw them. Yeah, that that tells a lot of background story better way. And oh, see, so there, there you have it. Like, there's always, yeah. something's yeah. always better than the other thing, whatever. Uh, Fine. Uh-huh. And this is, that's what I'm saying. People get super stickler about it. But then yeah. you take a movie like Guardians of the Galaxy, a movie uh-huh. that has a talking raccoon and a pretty much uh-huh. a Pokemon, right? Groot, he says his yeah. name, like Pokemon. That's what Pokemon yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> right. And they have like this guy who listens to a tape deck in space and they has like his hair out. Like how's yeah. that physically like possible in this uh-huh. universe? You know, they have people that are blue, yellow, green. This guy like uh-huh. literally whistles and this like little arrow flies wherever he goes, wherever he whistles. Like what uh-huh. the hell? And he like <laughs> he likes collecting these little like trinkets. Yeah. Everyone loves that movie. Yeah. I don't. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> oh God, you don't think you think you don't, yeah. but you do. I'm just kidding. The majority of people love that. Yeah, movie. yeah, that's you true. know what I mean. 
and and it's a commercial success everyone loved it right it's because it had a lot of charm it was a lot of fun yeah you know? um I mean, like, literally, the end of the, if you really put it in the context of the way I'm putting it, it makes it sound like the movie is stupid, right? Like, uh, there's a, the end of the movie, he, he, he defeats the guy through a dance battle. And they, like, they literally, like, hold hands. <laughs> they beat him. <laughs> and nobody, nobody bats an eye. Everyone's like, at least maybe some people do. <laughs> but the majority of people are like, damn, that's dope. Well, why? Because the narrative was simple, right? Like, yeah. When he was a kid, he didn't hold his hand of his mother. He was freaking out. He didn't want to accept her death. And then uh, and throughout the whole movie, everybody that's part of it is an outcast. They don't have a family. They don't have anywhere to belong. Everyone either lost their family or was exiled from their family, you know, mm-hmm. or were created, even though they didn't want to be created, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So that scene at the end when they're all family, finally, like there's a moment where, where Groot puts his roots around everybody, remember? And he says, we are Groot. <laughs> that like hits you hard because you're just like, what? Like the whole movie, he just kept on saying, I am Groot. And then now he's yeah. like, we are Groot. And you're like, oh, yeah. they're family, aw. You know? <laughs> yeah. Because we care about these people. We care about yeah. what they're doing. We care about who they are. And the silliness of the movie just mm. is adds to the charm, you know? Mm. Mm. And, you know, you have these super, like, I have a prediction that the Blade Runner movie is also going to probably not do well. Because, you know, Blade Runner, the original, wasn't that good either, man. It wasn't. Really? <laughs> like, everybody that, everybody that loves it is just artists. Like, I find my yeah. about it. Uh, yeah. 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 Blade Runner. Probably, yeah. <laughs> She's like, what is so, like, It's so the visuals. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, Ridley Scott's greatest films in terms of storytelling were Gladiator, The First mm-hmm. Alien, Terminator, Wait, did he yeah. do Terminator? I forget. Was that James Cameron? James Cameron did the second one. Did really did the first one? Who did the first Terminator? Doesn't matter. Let's just James see. Cameron was Terminator one and Terminator two. He was. That's right. I get that confused. So then, uh, but Ridley's definitely Gladiator was freaking amazing, right? The Martian mm-hmm. was amazing, you know. Yeah. But Robin Hood. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Prometheus? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about that one. Yeah, you know, just just because in Spielberg, right? Spielberg is one of the biggest storytellers, man. He's great at storytelling. Yeah. You know, he's really good at making you care about his characters. You mm-hmm. know? That's why a lot of his movies were freaking mega hits, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Jackie Chan once approached um uh he was talking to his like he was doing like a workshop mm-hmm. for the t- Chinese audiences. And he was talking about like, he, he was in Chinese too. And he was explaining to them, mm-hmm. um, he was talking to them and he was explaining to them that like, uh, you know, you know, there's something to be said about Western storytelling that Chinese yeah. directors have not approached. Mm-hmm. And I think mm-hmm. Korean directors are starting to do this too. Like, mm-hmm. Korean directors are starting to kill it. And Korea is specifically more Western than all yeah. the other Asian countries, right? So yeah. you guys get it. Like, you guys have made movies like Old Boy, um, The Host, right? Even that new yeah. one I haven't seen, The Train in Pusan or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. like you, you guys are starting to figure it out. Like, if you got to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, you got to make your mm-hmm. characters likable. And mm-hmm. so when you hurt them, you care, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Chinese yeah. directors don't do that as much. That's why the Chinese market loved Pacific Rim. Like, there's all the characters are super dry. There's no real, no <laughs> nothing humorous or nothing. I mean, one of the main characters' brother literally dies, and he yeah. gets over it in the first ten minutes of the film. Like, he, it never br- is brought up ever again that he's mm-hmm. like mourning the death of his brother and that he caused it. Mm-hmm. And more importantly, the relationship between the brothers, we don't really mm-hmm. care. Mm-hmm. and why did the chinese audiences love it well because chinese audiences love, love. robots punching monsters yeah. and that's why i love the movie because i also <laughs> love robots punching monsters if i know my one, number one critique of that movie yeah. was there was not enough robots punching yeah. monsters <laughs> there needed to be more they just they should have simplified the story they didn't need to spend 20 minutes explaining why we were using yeah. robots to fight giant monsters. They didn't need to explain that. Like, I'm already here, dude. I'm already here. I already accept 
that this yeah. movie's about monsters and robots, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't have to explain this whole weird, like, this event, series of events that caused us to create the Jaegers. I get it. Uh, like, it's, it's unnecessary. It really was. It really was unnecessary. They should just spend that extra 10 minutes of just, like, that scene where you had the, the Russian robots and I think it was the mm -hmm. Japanese robots with the, 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 the triplets, right? Uh -huh. That was yeah. a Chinese robot. Chinese the Chinese, Chinese robot. robots. They they, they got the, they got destroyed yeah. like immediately. Yeah. That should have been ten more minutes of just like epic like like fight that they eventually lose to move along the conflict of the plot, right? Mm -hmm. But not like so so immediate. It was just so stupid. Anyway, anyway, I'm getting back. I'm getting on a tangent. So check it out. Like, uh, what what movies came out in '82 other than The Blade Runner? Do you guys know? Uh. Not that specifically. Twenty-seven million dollars in eighty-two is not a lot of money. Okay, movies in the eighties. Let's see what's good. Oh yeah, Back to the Future. That's that's a good one. But, okay, now yeah. ET. That is in the same year. Yeah. So let's look at that one. Okay, so total gross thirty-two million versus ET. Just to give you some context, mm -hmm. nearly half a billion dollars. So was Blade Runner cool? <laughs> Did people actually <laughs> like that movie? <laughs> you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, I feel yeah. like people are blindsided by their nostalgia. That's all mm -hmm. I'm gonna get at. Yeah. I didn't like that movie. I fell asleep seven times watching that damn movie. <laughs> I was like, who cares? I don't care about anything in this movie. I don't care about your weird fartsy, <laughs> fartsy narrative, you know? Uh -huh. And I was so bored. And so, but E.T., man, classic. Mm -hmm. Even to this, to this day, I could show it to my kids and they'll freaking love it, you know? And the music. <laughs> right? Yeah. Blade Runner, what's the music? Exactly. <laughs> 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 yeah, just some weird like synth horns. Yeah, you're right. So, so it's not to say that it's bad. I'm just saying that maybe people were wrong to think that a lot of people loved it. That's all. Mm. Right? Like you guys liked it, and there's something wrong with that. You guys are welcome to like the movie. You know? Yep. Seriously, it's fine. Like it's, there's nothing wrong. But know who you're selling it to. So when they're making the sequel, and they keep it the artsy fartsy that it was in the past and they put a hundred million dollars to it like a budget of hundred million plus mm. uh, don't be shocked that nobody went to go watch it but if they made the movie let's say with a 20 million dollar budget or 30 million dollar budget that's more realistic yeah you know, keep your costs low because people might not want to watch this bullshit you know and so uh only to people like you guys who would love mm. Blade Runner and if you make it for your audience, then you'll you'll make you'll break even or make enough money to make the next one. You know who does this really well? Leica. Like, like they do, yeah, the company Leica. They always break even. They make their movies at cost, and they know who they're selling it to, and so they keep on making their movies. Like the movies like Caroline, um, mm -hmm. uh, Kubo. Ah, the animations. Yes, you, they yeah. they know what the fuck's up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They they yeah. know that this is not going to reach masses. They're just going to reach a very subset of people who really like this stuff. Yeah. And eventually, maybe they will make a movie that will hit the masses, but they're not, that's not their goal. Their, their goal is to, to put dinner on their table so they can make the next project. And that's more humbling and more rewarding, in my opinion, than just yeah. to make a major, major hit, you know? Hmm. And, and you look at a company like From Software, like the guys who made um, Dark Souls, same thing. Mm -hmm. Right? Like they made a game that they liked and they knew other people would like. They didn't care that the masses would hate it. Mm -hmm. They made their game for, I think it was like the first game. They made it for like a like really cheap. It was like mm -hmm. under a million dollars. Mm -hmm. And they sold like a few hundred thousand copies. So they made all their money back and some. They, they, they made it for really, really cheap. And it made so much money. Mm -hmm. um, you look at a movie like Deadpool. Deadpool was made for super cheap. Made tons of money. Star mm -hmm. Wars super cheap tons of money not anymore now they put yeah. a lot of money but the first star wars was somewhere between like 11 million to 12 million dollar budget if inflated for today that'd be like 50 million dollar budget that's like nothing mm. it's like chump change 
And obviously, we know that that movie was a mega hit, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, Lucas himself thought nobody was going to watch it. He, he was flying to Hawaii. He didn't even go to, like, he didn't want to stay in, uh, in the, the, the mainland <laughs> states. Yeah. He really was, he, he was so afraid that people were going to flip out and hate it. And then he was getting calls and people were like, where are you, dude? And he was like, oh, no, it's my worst nightmare. It's coming true. And they're like, no, oh, dude, like, there's lines going around buildings to watch the movie. And he was yeah. like, what? Like, he didn't even think it was going to be great. He thought, who's going to watch this nerdy shit about space swords and wizards and giant dog people? <laughs> <laughs> and people loved it. People fucking loved it. And so to kind of get to back to your question, you know, just be yeah. a little skeptical of your own opinion is what I'm trying to get at. You know, don't think that you know what's up because you, you might be entirely wrong. Mm. And so, um, so for instance, like, uh, what movie do I really love that is critically hated? Transformers, right? Everyone hates it. Like all my friends hate it. I only know a few <laughs> friends of mine that love it too, right? But most of my friends like fucking hate it. I love it, man. I love Transformers. I love robots. I love trancing transforming robots you got me you got me at robots um and then there was a movie that was critically loved that i loved but was a commercial flop uh shawshank mm -hmm. redemption oh i loved it yeah i loved it too i thought it was a great movie great story i think most people who watch it agree but nobody went and watched it in the theaters you know Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but trailers trailers at that time were really terrible. I mean, there could have been a lot of variables that prevented that movie from being in a hit. But maybe nobody wanted to watch that movie at the time, you know? And then now, in hindsight, people see the, the value of that movie, right? And that's what I'm trying to get at, though, is like, just because, you know, it, it, it's, it's here, here's another way of thinking about this, and I'm just going to end the class. One way to think about your guys' opinions and your guys' point of views, mm -hmm. you know, is that you should all also accompany it, accompany it with da data, like data. Don't just say it's good because it's story. Because some movies do really well that have mediocre stories, if any. Think of a movie like Mad Max Fury Road. Mm -hmm. Did that truly have a story that would be echoed in the, in the eons? You know, like when I'm sitting down with my kids and I want to really teach them a lesson, would I tell them the story of Fury Road? <laughs> <laughs> Right? <laughs> Not really. Like Shawshank Redemption, you can do that, right? Talk about how the world is, no matter how hard the world, world will fight you, you should find your way out. Yeah, that's a really good message there, right? And tell the, I can tell the Shawshank Redemption story to my kids. Yeah. They can get a moral lesson out of it. That's what I think good stories do. Mm -hmm. So then what is Mad Max if it doesn't have a good story, right? It it's just has a story. It has a beginning, middle, and it has a conflict. Like these girls are trying to escape, you know, imprisonment. But there's not like a really profound message or anything. And if there is, people are just making shit up. It's because it's just action packed. It's interesting. Like all the elements are just completely interesting. Like when mm -hmm. they spray paint their face with the silver yeah. spray paint, that's really interesting. The guy mm -hmm. with the flame, flame door guitar, really interesting. When they're walking through yeah. the swamps that they reveal later was the, the glory land that they were trying to go to. You know, mm. and those like people on those weird pet legging things, interesting. The 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 cars themselves, interesting. The chase yeah. themselves, interesting. Everything is just so interesting, you know. Mm. So and uh, you know the director is really smart. He understands that as long as I keep the story simple, mm. I can do all this crazy shit. Mm. You know, because then people can focus on the crazy shit and not get distracted yeah. with the story. And mm -hmm. it's vice versa, if you want to like complicate a story, you might have to keep a simple theme so that people mm -hmm. don't get confused. It's mm -hmm. like Star Wars, the same thing. And Star Wars, super simple story, but a lot of things are going on, right? Yeah. And so you have, to, you have to get data. Like, think about everything. And so when you're making your own game or you're making your own project or you're working mm -hmm. on a project for someone else and they're making a choice, let's say, like you're working on a, a project that's going to be for Blade Runner. Yeah. Then you, you can be like, we need to work faster because mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of money to spend because this might not be a commercial. This won't pay all our paychecks. It's not going to be Transformers money. There's no mm -hmm. way. This is, very, this is very clearly a niche audience. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. 
And if you agree with that niche audience, then you can respect that, right? But if you're like working for um, like, you know, the Transformers movie, then you have, like, we need the more explosions. We need this thing to be, like this Transformer has to look like it's made out of razor blades and shrapnel, <laughs> you know? So that way it will sell because people want to see this in the theater, right? Let me give you a great example of what, when I was really aware of this. I was designing uh, Iceman for the, the, the movie uh, Days of Future Past. Mm-hmm. And when I was designing him, my costume designer asked me to remove the sleeves. And uh-huh. I, was, I was like, why? I was like, this looks pretty cool. I like the like, kind of like he's wearing a coat. I know he's Iceman, so he shouldn't be really cold. There's no reason mm-hmm. to wear a jacket, but it's just, you know, it kind of reinforces that cold, right? Yeah. And she's like, no, 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 get rid of, like, get the sleeves. And I was like, okay, so you just want to really amplify, like, I guess he's the ice man, right? So he doesn't get cold. And so she's like, no, no, the actor's a handsome actor, and I'm sure he's muscular, so it would be good to show his muscles. <laughs> and I'm like, what the shallow? <laughs> but in my head, I thought that. But then I was like, but no, she's got a point. Like, this isn't, you know, an art film. Yeah. This is a movie that's supposed to hit the masses. This is supposed to, this character is supposed to make the boys be like, I want to be Iceman and make the girls want to be like, I want to date Iceman. <laughs> I mean, it sounds terrible, but that's just the reality, right? Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, and it's harmless. It really is. And so I'm like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And, and honestly, it was better to, without the, <laughs> the coat. And I think we ended up giving him like armor too, to kind of just like reinforce that. But I think they found that the actor wasn't muscular, so they ended up putting this coat over him anyway. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, like, think about it. Like, Hugh Jackman, as soon as he can, his shirt's coming off, right? Uh Wolverine. Like, it's just, that's just, it's necessary. Because we got to see how yoked Wolverine is, you know? We got to see. He's got to shred some people. You know, it would be bizarre if Ryan Gosling in the new Blade Runner just took his shirt off and just started shooting people in sweat gloss over his body. Because the context is completely different, you know. Yeah. But, but that's at the same time, no one's looking at that, those trailers and be like, "Man, I want to be moved emotionally and psychologically." Nobody's doing that. It, <laughs> that's why I'm really curious to see how Valerian's gonna do. Because I don't mm-hmm. even like Valerian. I don't, I know why I'm going to watch it. Because oh, yeah, like concept art orgy, man. I am like, <laughs> freaking excited. Um, but will it do commercially well? Well, we'll see if, if the characters are likable. Uh, that will help. People will spread the word. But all the critiques right now, all the, the critics are saying visually studying, creative orgy, you know, like everything yeah. that has nothing to do with the story. And so it makes me think that it might not do so well. It's also up against Dunkirk, which is... Oh, is it? Is that coming out? Yeah, that's coming out uh, this weekend. So it's, it's got some... Terrible timing. Competition. Ugh, Jesus. Dunkirk is a new Chris Nolan movie if anyone isn't keeping up with movies. Oh, no, I, I am. Yeah, that that's bad timing, man. Yeah. I'd rather watch Dunkirk. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I had the choice to spend my $12, I'd rather yeah. watch Dunkirk. And it's because I'd rather just, like, uh, be riveted than be splurged. I will watch both, though. Don't get me wrong. But if I had to choose... I'm um, choosing that one, right? Anyway, I'm going to end the class now. Hopefully that gives you some larger insight about your own personal beliefs and opinions. You're allowed to have them, right? Like I'm drawing this weird monster thing and I, it, I, know, I, know, I know that only a few people in this world are going to appreciate this. And that's how I make a living, guys. Like I sell to the people who care about this type of stuff. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not trying to break, <laughs> bake, uh, bake, break bank every time I do a concert. I'm just trying to make a, a, a living. And I, luckily for me, I get approached on projects that are also interested in this type of aesthetic. It's nice. I can reinforce what I already like to do. But anyway, I'm going to go now, guys. Thanks for hanging in for, for so long. Appreciate y'all. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. With that Yay. being said, I'll talk to you guys next week. Put your hearts into it. It's last last week after this class or after today. So last week, next week. So put the best effort you can and I'll talk to you guys. Um, just yeah. real quick, the drawings I was supposed to do, should I do them in color as well or just? Yeah, everybody go, go balls to the walls. Right? <laughs> balls <laughs> to the walls. And if you don't have balls, because some of you don't, 
buy some balls and then throw them to the wall. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and even even the the male students buy balls. Don't throw your physical balls. Use outside balls too. I would <laughs> advise against it. But you guys get what I'm saying. All right, <laughs> I'm gonna go now. Later. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.